probably noticed that as you sit here meditating, thinking about the breath, evaluating the breath, you're talking to yourself. Reminding yourself now, stay here, and commenting on how the breath is and trying to think up ways that the breath could be better, where to focus, what you find interesting, what you find useful. It's actually an important part of the meditation. It's called verbal fabrication, the way the mind chatters to itself. And what you're trying to do is learn how to make this chattering, which is often a problem, actually part of the path. An element of your concentration that helps the mind to settle down with a sense of interest, with a sense of comfort, with a sense of well-being. Then as the well-being gets more and more firmly established, the mind gets more centered, then you can drop a lot of the chatter because it's served a real purpose. Now one of the ways you learn how to be skillful in your internal chatter is to be skillful in your external chatter. This is why right speech is an important part of the path. The way we talk to ourselves has a lot to do with the way we've heard other people talk and the way we've been talking to others. And so if most of the records are, I guess now they're MP3 files playing in our minds, or of unskillful speech, you're going to find yourself engaging in unskillful speech in your meditation as well. People who are exposed to a lot of negativity and find themselves dealing in that negativity as they meditate. So you've got to learn new habits. And you don't learn new habits simply by stopping and not talking at all. You learn new habits by actually engaging in other people with right speech. So it's good to think about what, how the Buddha defined right speech. Four ways, four types of speech that you want to avoid. Lying, harsh speech, divisive speech, and idle chatter. And each of these is defined by the intention behind it. Lying is the intention to deceive, to misrepresent the truth. Our speech is, what you say, with the intent of hurting somebody's feelings. Divisive speech is breaking up friendships. And idle chatter is basically speech without any real clear intention at all. Just chattering away for the sake of having something to say. And so you want to learn how to avoid these forms of speech and also learn some of the nuances of right speech. Because in some cases it's not very clear-cut. Now with lying it is clear-cut. You don't want to misrepresent the truth to anybody, ever. That's why it's one of the precepts, i.e. a rule that you lay down for yourself and then you try to hold to in all situations. Now this of course is going to be a test of your ingenuity and your discernment, because there will be times when people will ask questions, and you know that answering the question is going to give rise to problems. The Buddha himself said that he would not tell the truth in areas where it would give rise to greed, anger, and delusion. And that, that doesn't mean he would lie, it means simply he would avoid those topics. So you've got to figure out skillful ways of avoiding. Someone comes up and says, you know, have you seen my husband with another woman? And you have. You've got to figure out a way to change the topic.
turn the question on the woman and says, Why? Are you, do you suspect anything of your husband? So you can avoid answering the question. But that's a special case. But still, even, even in the special cases, you cannot misrepresent the truth, which is why that's a precept, as opposed to the other forms of wrong, wrong and right speech. Because there are times, for instance, when harsh speech is necessary. The Buddha gives an analogy. It's like having a child, a young baby who still doesn't know what to eat and what not to eat, and she's put a sharp piece of glass in her mouth. You've got to do everything you can to get the glass out, even if it means drawing blood, because if the baby swallows the glass, it's even worse. In the Buddha's case, he, had, he said harsh things about Devadatta to Devadatta's face, one in the hopes that Devadatta might come to his senses, and two to warn all the other monks around him that Devadatta had really gone off course. And someone once called him on this. Said, Would the Buddha ever say anything harsh to anyone? With the idea being that if the Buddha said, no. Then he said, well, what, what about what you said to Devadatta? That was harsh. It hurt Devadatta's feelings. And if the Buddha said yes, he would say harsh things to other people. Then they would say, well, what's the difference between you and other people, ordinary people? And so when they put the question to the Buddha, he said, that question doesn't deserve a categorical answer. It deserves an analytical answer. He said, there are times when in deciding what to say, he would ask, one, is it true? If it wasn't true, he wouldn't say it. Second one, is it beneficial? And if it's one of those rare cases when saying something harsh would be beneficial, then the next one is, is this the right time and place for that? And only if you could say yes to all three questions should you say, should you say those things. This principle applies to harsh speech. It also applies to divisive speech, because there are times when you see one of your friends suddenly developing a friendship with someone who you know is abusive, you know is corrupt, you know is going to harm that person. And you've got to find the right way to protect that person. So again, you may end up saying something that may, may sound divisive, but it's with compassion and intent. And as for idle chatter, well, there are times when simple social grease conversation is necessary to keep the situation lubricated. But you've got to be very clear, and this is where it's, it's no longer as real idle chatter. You've got to be clear on the point at which it starts just becoming totally pointless, purposeless. I mean, how much should you say to make people feel at ease, and then when do you stop? This requires real discernment, which is why there's no precept for this particular type of wrong speech, because it really requires your discernment. And once you understand the nuances of right speech, then you can start applying the same principles in your mind. One, you never lie to yourself. And you will find yourself, as you're meditating, lying in all sorts of subtle ways. You've got to catch that. Throw the light of your awareness on it. Highlight it to yourself. Say, look, this is not true. The mind tends to put up all sorts of walls of denial. This is one of the reasons why people find it hard to see their intentions, because they're used to lying to themselves about their intentions. Very few people would like to admit that they're operating on corrupt intentions. Or even if they know what they're doing is not quite right, they try to justify it in one way or another. But as a meditator, you can't engage in that at all, because that's precisely the ignorance that's going to keep you suffering. Now, as for harsh speech, there are times when you have to come down hard on yourself. You see yourself giving in to unskillful habits again and again and again. 
And there are some times when you've got to say, hey, look, this is foolish. This is stupid. Use whatever language you find is effective. It gets the message across. Same with divisive speech. If you're becoming friends with your defilements, you've got to point out their, their bad qualities. Remind yourself of what greed has done for you in the past, what lust has done for you in the past. Anger, delusion, all the unskillful mental qualities. You want to divide yourself from them. And as for idle chatter, you try to turn it into purposeful chatter. In other words, there are times when you have to encourage yourself, say nice things about yourself. Remind yourself of all the good things you've done in the past. Well, this turns it from idle chatter into actually a purposeful kind of meditation. Sila Anusti, remembering all the times when you avoided doing harmful things. Jaka Anusti, remembering the times when you were generous, not only with things, but also with your, your, with your goodwill, with your compassion, with your forgiveness. In other words, there are times you've got to learn how to put yourself in a good mood. Otherwise, the meditation gets dry. It freezes up like, a, like an engine that doesn't have any oil. That's what this means, is that you apply the same three questions to your thoughts that you do to your speech. One, is it true? If it's not true, don't say it. Don't think it. Two, is it beneficial? And then if it is beneficial, then the three, is this the right time for that? This is the time to come down hard on the mind, or is this the time to encourage and console the mind? This is the time to pry it away from its friendship with greed, anger, and delusion. What's the most effective way of doing that? Because sometimes if you do it in an ineffective way, the mind gets more defensive. There's a rule that John Fuang used to have, which, which is, if you know somebody has gotten really deluded in their meditation. If you're not that person's teacher, don't talk to them about it. Don't try to criticize them or point out the fallacies in the meditation, because that will just make them even more defensive. I mean, there's a lot of conceit that builds up around this. So there are those areas where you just leave it alone. But with yourself, you should be a lot more frank about where your friendship with your various ideas and your very attachments really is leading you. But learn how to do it in such a way that you really can show that you're operating with a mind's best interests in, at heart. So there's a skill to write speech, both inside and outside. There are nuances. When you learn the nuances, then your directed thought and evaluation really does become part of the concentration. As I say in the sutta, mindfulness of breathing. There are times when you need to gladden the mind. There are times when you need to release the mind from its attachments. And so you learn how to breathe in such a way that helps you do that, and you learn how to talk to the mind in such a way that helps you do that. This way, internal right speech and external right speech all become part of the path.